All right, our next case is United States versus Rabinowitz, and uh, this is a, a U.S. Supreme Court case, and uh, we are talking about culpability, uh, a criminal act. We're talking about a criminal act as a requirement um, uh, under criminal law. And we are going to take a look at this case. It's a 1915 case um, to discuss what the court was talking about concerning overt acts. Now, this is a case that involved a, um, an indictment for conspiracy under the Bankruptcy Act. And uh, to state the facts, basically, there was a conspiracy alleged in this situation. There were apparently um, six participants. And uh, there was a, a bankruptcy. And the, the allegations were that some of the participants in this conspiracy um, got together and, 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 and said, what we're going to do is we're going to have this bankruptcy. And uh, after the, during the bankruptcy, we're going to hide certain property from the trustee. And uh, that was, uh, you know, the, the basis of their conspiracy. So th we, we asked the question as to uh, what, the, what the issue was in, before the Supreme Court in this case. And um, the narrow question the, that the court identified was whether a conspiracy having for its object the commission of an offense denounced as criminal by the Bankruptcy Act is in itself an offense arising under that act uh, within the meaning of the statute. Now, um, this case is important not only because of you know the outcome of, of, of the case. I mean, uh, here again, it's a 1915 case. Uh, but we're, we're, here again, I, I advise you to, to keep track as to where you are during law school when you're reading any cases because uh, it's, it's very important for you, understand, for you to understand why the case is, is put in, into your, your, your syllabus, why it's in the case book, why you're reading, where you are uh, uh, in criminal law. And, 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 and basically, the, the court is, is talking about overt acts versus conspiracy. And uh, the, the general ruling is, is something that you're going to be discussing in your classroom. So the, the professor is going to look at you, and you're going to be sitting there uh, having you know, uh, bright eyes and bushy tails, and you're going to anticipate that the professor is going to call on you, and, and, and that's what's going to happen. The professor is going to call on you and, and ask you, what is the significance of an overt act concern, you know, as to uh, a conspiracy? And uh, you're, you're going to uh, be discussing uh, cases such as this, and the agreement, the agreement among the, the parties to commit uh, a particular act. And, and the agreement is the essence of the conspiracy. The uh, overt act is the, is the, uh, is the, um, is essential to the, the crime itself. And in this particular case, the Supreme Court is addressing those very uh, issues. Uh, the court says it is apparent from a reading of uh, 37 criminal code statute, it has been repeatedly declared in decisions of this court that a conspiracy to commit a crime is different, a different offense from the crime that is the object of the conspiracy. Um, and uh, the court goes on to say that, uh, nor do we forget that a mere conspiracy without an overt act done in pursuance of it is not criminally punishable under the statute. So you need an overt act uh, of some sort. There must be an overt act. It's the very next thing the court says. There must be an overt act, but this need not, need not be a criminal act itself. In other words, there has to be, the court is saying here that there has to be some action taken by the persons who are being charged with conspiracy for them to be uh, held guilty of con conspiracy. Um, the court goes on to say that uh, it's not even necessary for all of the participants to have uh, joined in the overt act. So you've got A, B, and C over here and D, E, F over there, and A, B, and C are the guys who are, you know, uh, doing the overt act, whatever that may be, and D, E, F are, you know, they're, they're agreeing to the conspiracy. They're not doing anything. When it's all said and done, when they're all brought before the court, uh, when they all are arrested and accused of conspiracy, that agreement by D, E, and F with A, B, and C is uh, considered to be part of the conspiracy, and the overt act by A, B, and C is the overt act that's used to support the, uh, the uh, prosecution against all six defendants. 
And uh, court you know, talks about uh, other elements of, of, the, of, of this area and the, your professor is going to probably look at you and say, oh, excuse me, Mr. Smith, or excuse me, Ms. Jones, but can you tell me whether or not uh, the court dealt with the uh, possibility of incapacity? And they're alluding to something that the court said in this particular case. And you're going to scratch your head and look around and say, what is oh, yeah, the court did say something. The court said that a person may be guilty of conspiring, conspiring although incapable of committing the offense, uh, the objective offense. Okay, because the court is identifying its rationale by saying, look, there's there's certain kind of behavior, criminal behavior that we want to stop. We've got this, this all this secrecy. We've got all these people who are you know clandestinely getting together and they're they're planning to break the law, and and. Society has an, there's a, a social interest in uh, punishing that behavior because it's, 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 it's contrary to, to what we want to do in our society. And uh, the court in this case um, was uh, very clear that uh, uh, there, there's got to be some, some overt act, and the overt act does not have to be uh, an act that's part, the, the, the act of the ultimate crime itself, just an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy.